Okay, so today's uh, green rounds. I, I chose a topic: um, pathophysiology of lordotic back pain in athletes. Uh, I picked it for uh, um, a few reasons. Uh, one, I have some of these, uh, or one of these um, pathologies, uh, and uh, two, I wanted to try to relate this to um, some sports topics um, since I haven't had you know, a whole lot of um, you know, actual interventional experience. So I figured this would be a good way to sort of describe these conditions. Um, so basic outline here: uh, we'll just go through some of the uh, background of some of some uh, back pain briefly, biomechanics of the spine, which will play a key role in all these conditions, and uh, go through some of the main conditions, um, including spondylolisthesis, spondylolisthesis, and facet joint syndrome. Uh, and then we'll touch briefly on some uh, studies and uh, interventions. So uh, back pain, uh, you've probably been tired of hearing all these stats uh, over and over again, but I'll go through them once more. Um, there's a uh, lifetime back pain prevalence of 60, 70%, and that's you know, highly variable in the uh, literature. Uh, what we do know is it's very predominant, um, and of the back pain, um, about a third of it is um, considered chronic, which means lasting longer than a three-month period or recurring after a three-month period. Um, again, uh, the most common cause of miswork is, uh, is uh, back pain from uh, medical problems, and it's the second most common reason to seek primary care. Um, some more interesting statistics, though. Um, so uh, of school-age children, 90% um, with back pain will eventually suffer lower back pain uh, later in life. Um, and I have in my um, paper uh, a few studies that, that um, talk about the uh, initial onset um, of the back pain. So the earlier the onset, the more likely you are to have a uh, chronic back pain issue in the future. Um, and this is also dose-related. So the more time or more events um, of back pain as a child, the more likely you are to have back pain as an adult. Uh, and this makes sense as, a, you know, these children are probably – Predisposed for whatever reason, either through their activities or through their actual path or, or through their actual uh, biomechanics. Um, and I want to talk specifically in this talk about um, how athletes are predisposed to different kinds of back pain, different mechanisms um, than the average um, patient will see. So first, like talk about the uh, curvature of the lumbar spine. Um, briefly, go through some of the uh, major anatomy. So um, of note in the anatomy is that um, the uh, vertebral Size increases as you go cranial to caudal, um, and this is would you know essentially create a support system where you're loading the uh, lumbar spine, which is the most heavily loaded portion of the spine, sort of like a pyramid, where it is able to bear weight uh, in a more stable way. Um, the uh, actual vertebral bodies are larger anterior posterior, which creates a um, sort of a wedge shape, which helps contribute to the uh, lordosis uh, as seen in the curvature uh, in the uh, in images on the right. Um, the lordosis is, is um, variable, but it's usually between 30 and 50 degrees. You can see in the lower image that um, th that's one method to uh, measure it. Um, and there's also, you can measure within each uh, vertebral body as well. <clears throat> and uh, interestingly, um, the uh, position of the uh, facet joints also uh, uh, mirrors the um, pyramidal shape. Uh, as from the thoracic to the lumbar spine, you see the facet joints start to march out more and more laterally, uh, increasing the base of support. Um, and we can also talk about sort of um, the uh, orientation of these later and how that relates to uh, back pain and motion. Um, in my paper, there's also a study that I mentioned um, briefly that uh, talks about um, it's sort of a novel study where they took off the four legs of a rat um, like shortly after being born. The rats would then um, ambulate and, uh, you know, and walk like humans sort of and then they would um, measure their back and their curvature of their spine actually became more lordotic. Um, and this coincides with humans where, you know, you know, at birth our spines aren't really in this lordotic position, but it's through um, ambulation and weight bearing and bipedal stance that causes this uh, lumbar lordosis shortly after birth. So this uh, leads into um, sort of how the weight's distributed in, in the spine. Um, I use the uh, Dennis a model to uh, describe that. Um, this was um, a study originally done looking at spinal fractures, um, and they categorize them as three different um, types of spinal fractures. Um, <clears throat> one is the uh, anterior column, as I see in the picture, the medial column, and the posterior column. Um, I like to focus mostly on the posterior column, as um, it'll be preferentially stressed in a uh, lordotic stance um, under compressive loads, um, and that would include hyperextension. Uh, in the lower picture here, you see the yeah, neutral spine versus the arch spine. Um, <clears throat> in the neutral spine, you see the force diagram there um, has uh, <clears throat> fairly 
limited compression and shear forces compared to the overall um, force side, the force. But in the uh, arch spine, the same force is now producing a higher compressive load on the spine and a higher shear force in the spine. Um, and this must be uh, taken up somewhere as far as um, the weight bearing. And um, with the uh, lordotic spine, you'll tend to see the uh, uh, extensor muscles and soft tissues as well as the um, skeletal portions of the posterior spine take some of this load up to prevent the shearing of the spine forward. And we'll um, talk more about that later. So just um, a brief anatomy, um, just for just to orient you a little better. Um, we'll talk mostly about the uh, a little more extensors in this talk. The extensors <laughs> that are um, predominant are the uh, erectors. Uh, as you can see, they expand the uh, thoracic into the lumbar spine. Um, they're the main movers of this uh, of the hyperextension, um, and also the uh, multifidi, which span each individual um, vertebral body, and they're more considered um, stabilizing muscles that will tend to initiate their uh, contraction prior to movement rather than being the actual movers of the, of the um, spine. And then there's other support muscles um, listed that I, I won't go through all those today. Um, <clears throat> of note though, the extensors um, are estimated to be about 30% stronger than the flexors uh, as I found in one study. Um, and this is uh, responsible for um, protecting the spine during those uh, shearing and compressive forces. Um, of note, you know, you could assume that people that are um, constantly um, exposed to these forces in a you know, lordotic spine would have um, hypertrophy and uh, increasing strength of these muscles, possibly leading to even more imbalance. <clears throat> uh, to balance out the extensors, we have the uh, flexors of the spine. The, the uh, major ones are all the abdominal muscles as seen uh, in the, on the right here, um, as well as the iliopsoas and the uh, quadratus muscle. Um, these are somewhat underpowered compared to the other muscles. Um, and typically you'll see athletes with um, weak core strength and that leads to a lot of back problems as we all know. Um, some of these problems stem from uh, anterior pelvic tilt. Um, I mentioned some of the uh, imbalances that can occur. You see in the image on the uh, bottom, um, sort of the, a diagram of that where you have um, shortened um, hypertrophied extensors uh, which is probably necessary to maintain um, stability under high loads. You also have um, shortened hip flexors, weak abdominal muscles, and typically weak gluteal muscles uh, as seen above. Um, you could you could think about this as, uh, you know, as, as um, people now, we, we sit a lot of times, we have shortening of the hip flexors is very common, and we have the spinal curvature, which is probably predisposed us to shortening of the erectors. So we have a tight lordotic spine, tight hip flexors, and weak stabilizers. And this is especially exemplified in uh, heavy lifting, um, also um, in linemen, those sort of positions. Um, my experience was uh, I used to play football and power lift, and so I have some, and so um, I've seen people throughout the years with this um, exaggeration of the spine, um, and, it, and it, it makes sense mechanistically. So some ways you can correct the anterior pelvic tilt. Um, if we see patients with this, it's pretty easy to see. Um, you can try to maybe give them some, some exercise recommendations or have them um, uh, do PT. On the uh, left there is just a simple hip flexor stretch, top left. Um, a gluteal bridge on the upper, upper right would strengthen the weak gluteal muscles, as mentioned. It also provides maybe some core strengthening and uh, um, stretching of hip flexors if they're severely tightened. Bottom two are forms of planks, with the one on the, on the bottom right being a stomach vacuum, which would um, preferentially strengthen the transverse house muscle or transverse uh, abdominals. Um, keeping the, the yeah, stomach sucked in, which essentially um, produces core strength and uh, limits lower back um, strain. So just a quick overview for those of you that don't know powerlifting. Um, it is a uh, sport that consists of three lifts. Um, they're all on the right here. Um, the first is usually the squat, followed by the bench and the deadlift. These are some diagrams that just kind of go through some of the forces associated with these and, and some of the form. Um, usually, in a contest, there'll be um, three lifts with uh, three attempts each at a maximum weight, and um, it's by weight class, and typically you'll have uh, the weights all added up, um, best squat, best deadlift, and best bench press, and the uh, total weight is, is the winner of the contest for that weight class. Um, I found this is a good model for uh, lordotic back pain. One, because uh, a number of patients um, you'll, you'll see will be in sports or lifting um, heavily and have some of these same conditions. And two, because um, 
it's a, a high compressive load with a lordotic spine, and um, it sort of exemplifies um, these risk factors that we'll talk about in some of the pathologies. Just uh, a real quick talk about the weightlifting injury profile. Uh, as we see patients in, um, in sports clinic, you'll uh, likely see patients that um, will have a slightly lower injury rate compared to other sports. You will see a lot of the same acute type of injuries show up, tendonitis, sprains, strains, um, same, yeah, same um, pathologies that will also present in, in those cases, in the acute case of the shoulder, knee, and back. Um, but I think what we'll end up seeing more is the overuse injuries, um, more of the uh, degenerative injuries. Um, and so that's what we'll talk about today in more detail. Uh, I want to show this picture because uh, I mentioned earlier um, that infants um, don't have a natural lordotic spine before ambulation. Um, but however, shortly after ambulation, you do see a, a lordotic spine. And in this case, this, uh, this uh, infant here, or baby, is um, able to squat with essentially perfect form without any training at all. You see the, their back is uh, in a neutral position. Their knees are appropriately placed. They're getting pretty deep there, and they probably sit like that for an hour, and it wouldn't bother them with back pain or with uh, tiring. However, the guy here on the right, you know, after years of sitting, poor form, um, probably too much weight, he has a lot of uh, form issues. Looks like he has the bar on probably C7. His lower back is in a flexion. Um, posture, and so he set himself up for a lot of uh, back injuries. And this is just um, a brief slide to show what the form of the back probably should like, look like in these lifts. So you've seen the, the, the deadlift uh, top left, um, a very neutral spine. Um, same thing with the squat here. Um, although they have different stances, the spine is still neutral, um, resulting in different you know, compressive and shear forces. On the upper right though, you'll see even in exercise like the bench press, because of the uh, curvature of the spine, you can have a lordosis. Some people go to the extreme. They'll arch their back. I mean, it, it, it just looks painful. Um, but they'll essentially do that to shorten their, their uh, arms and um, increase the you know, leg drive to help their lift. But uh, you can imagine seeing someone that even exclusively benches have back pain um, just from doing those sort of maneuvers. Some of the uh, other risk factors I want to talk about, uh, I want to go through some of the other sports that would be um, similar. Uh, gymnastics, as you can see in the upper right, um, very extreme lordosis there. Same thing with the uh, strongman competition. Um, NFL linemen, linebackers, those types, um, due to um, their position of uh, high compressive forces, and they are typically tackling or um, rushing or blocking in a uh, lordotic stance. And this would be especially true with um, any prior back injury, fatigue would, uh, would make that worse. Um, I mentioned some of the other issues earlier. So now I want to talk about some of the pathologies that, um, that you would think of as stemming from this. One of the most um, common you'll, you'll see and hear about is spondylolysis, um, especially in this population. It's, um, it's fairly common as a presenting symptom or cause. Um, it's a, a defect in the pars articularis. Um, it can be acute. You can have a stress a, a fracture from, a, from a, some sort of acute injury. Uh, but typically it's chronic. You'll see a stress fracture as seen on the right. Um, typically it's also unilateral, um, most likely at L5 followed by 4 and L3. Um, and that's because um, higher forces and also um, L5 sits on the uh, sacrum as well. And all the same things we talked about as risk factors for back pain and all the same sports um, would all be included in this list of people that are um, at higher risk. Uh, you also see patients in baseball, soccer, and golf not thought of as um, very um, high axial loading sports. However, um, given the orientation of the lumbar spine and the facet joints, as we mentioned, uh, and we'll talk more about later, the um, rotational aspect of baseball and soccer um, actually leads to a higher number of patients with this condition as well, or at least presenting pain from this condition. Um, and then you'll see on the uh, bottom right, um, this would be this is a cartoon drawing of what you'd see on, in an oblique view of the spine um, of a patient during presentation. Uh, it has this typical Scotty dog um, look. You see the, uh, the ear in the right, or the ear in the foreleg, or the uh, superior and inferior articular processes. Um, the transverse process is the um, nose and the pedicle is the eye. Um, and on x ray, you'll see that um, there's actually a, you know, a collar where the, where the um, defect would be. <clears throat> 
Um, so just a quick background on spondylolysis as well. Um, it's reported at about 5 to 8% of the population. I've seen variable rates of this as well. Um, it's somewhere around there, though, um, from most of the studies I've seen. Um, some studies do cite that it's, it's higher in this population. Um, it's hard to say whether that's um, because they present with the pain, because it's um, acted upon by the sport, or if it's actually um, something to do with the sport itself causing the actual defect. Um, <clears throat> I mentioned before it's um, that uh, lordosis is not um, something that is uh, prior to ambulation, and this as well is not prior to ambulation, leading you to believe that uh, this um, lordotic curvature and the forces of the spine and the bipedal stance are what predispose pa patients to this uh, defect, among other things. Um, of note, it is um, likely to run in families. Uh, it is at higher risk in a, the immature skeleton. Um, and uh, the lumbar spine, you got to figure it is the uh, largest portion of the spine. Um, so during um, growth in uh, adolescence, it will be the most rapidly growing, highest strain portion. Um, and pa patients at risk for these conditions, at, in the sports I mentioned earlier, um, they'll put preferential stress on the posterior skeletal elements of this immature spine. And um, given their, their strength and activity and um, overall um, you know, uh, normal health, the first thing to give is likely, in this case, the uh, PARS. Um, and I think a similar thing is that the uh, male to female rate of this has been studied at 3 to 1. Um, I think that might have to do with males experiencing more growth and also uh, higher forces on it, as likely seen by a lot of the sports and uh, body weight as well. Uh, I did want to go through a quick case report. Uh, I mentioned I had um, this condition um, when I was uh, probably 16 or so. Uh, I was going through the uh, literature and found a case report that I actually had to check and see that it wasn't my uh, orthopedic doctor who, who posted it because it looks so eerily similar. Um, so, I, so here we have 26-year-old male. He's presenting with um, a back pain flare. He's had back pain since he was 17. Um, back pain had initial onset where he knew right when he first had back pain in his life, he was uh, making a tackle, he hyperextended his back, um, he felt instantly pain, but he was able to play through it, was able to play for some time, uh, was afraid to lose his position, all those sort of things. Um, so it wasn't completely debilitating, had no signs of anything as far as ridiculous symptoms, um, and kind of was able to go through it. He then experienced um, more trouble with flares throughout the season, eventually um, sought treatment, and was treated with um, PT and a uh, back brace. Um, but now he's presenting at age 26 with a reflare. Um, so I don't know if he was completely worked up in the first um, in his first treatment cycle, but when he was tw um, at, at 26, he had um, an AP lateral and oblique x-rays of the back, which did show uh, spondylolysis. Um, his symptoms uh, at presentation, he had um, bilateral aching of the back. Uh, it was intermittent right um, sided sharp pain. Um, that would only radiate to the buttocks, not below. Um, he had no true signs of any kind of red flags, such as bowel and bladder incontinence. Um, on exam, uh, I thought this was, I thought this was um, a good description of sort of how I felt it to be as well. Um, on exam, the uh, clinician was unable to really produce the, the exact same pain. Um, it was the same pain. It was the same location of the pain, but the um, patient said that you know you you got pushed deeper. It's hard to get that same feeling. Um, to kind of bring it out. Um, there was also muscle spasm, weakness of the muscles. Uh, I mentioned um, earlier about the multifidi being the stabilizer of the spine. Um, I don't think I included this in the PowerPoint, but um, in my paper there is a, uh, um, a brief mention that uh, even after one back injury, you can have um, atrophy of these muscles. So you have essentially the stabilizing muscles of the spine shut down um, and therefore you lose stability. I mentioned before they tend to contract before um, the actual back movement and so you get discoordination of this as well and it sets you up for um, rather than, than, than the uh, soft tissue elements of the spine um, you have the uh, posterior spinal elements taking over the brunt of the force. Um, also this patient had the classic anterior pelvic tilt, um, he's positive Thomas test, he had a pinching sensation with hip hike as well. So this patient actually had bilateral spondylolysis, um, but no translation of the uh, vertebral body. Um, so just a brief talk about the uh, diagnosis. Um, you really only need um, x-rays to diagnose the condition. You can see in the bottom right here, 
Um, you can see a defect in the lateral as well as the oblique view. The oblique I mentioned is where you see the classic Scotty dog, and it's actually pretty well visualized here where the defect is the collar in this case. Um, some of the other imaging really comes into play whenever you think about acute versus chronic and um, healing versus uh, non-union in these patients. Um, the top left, you'll see a, a bone scan. The lesion of the lumbar spine lit up is, is obviously the area of concern, um, showing activity there, uh, as well as the CT on the upper right shows bilateral defects uh, of the pars, and the, the, the center shows the same um, on one side. Um, and this is because while this is a, a bony defect, um, you don't always have bony resolution. So the x-ray, even if someone is pain-free, resolved, did all the treatment, and is able to go back to play, you may never see full resolution of that, um, that defect on an x-ray because you can have fibrous tissue, cartilage, this sort of thing growing in um, to varying degrees of strength, um, which at times could be lax and at times it could be um, functional, similar to skeletal elements. Um, so this is something that you could we'd use to say, you know, this patient's at further risk or this is why the pain is still there. Um, we talked a little bit about the conservative treatment already. Um, typically, you know, these patients will be under relative rest. Uh, a lot of times um, they'll also wear a back brace one to three months. Um, I can tell you it's not too enjoyable to wear one of those for, you know, when you're in high school. Um, I'm not sure, you know, basically it's um, keeping you from overextending your back, giving it a chance to heal. Um, however, when you do that, you're obviously going to have um, some flexibility and uh, musculoskeletal imbalances afterwards. So at that point, you want to have a lot of um, physical therapy. Uh, they'll be targeting things like we talked about anterior pelvic tilt. tilt. Um, and again, if you want to look and see, you can use a CT to, to maybe show signs of resolution. Um, here's just a brief slide to show a brace and also um, some other exercises that you may do. They're all, they're all pretty interrelated. They're all working on core strength, lower back um, endurance. Um, I mentioned the, multif the uh, multifidi before. They um, are a uh, major stabilizing element of the spine. And when those are weakened, um, you tend to have more back pain. And so that's why a lot of the uh, rehab therapies will be more on endurance. Um, and you might think that these patients, you know, if they're doing heavy weightlifting or they're into uh, sports, you know, why are we working on endurance when they're doing one rep maxes? Um, I mentioned that these muscles are will contract beforehand, and it's usually when the endurance gives out that you'll have the pain. So even these uh, high actually loading, short burst type sports like you know football and powerlifting, um, endurance is still the major uh, stabilizing force from the multifidi. <clears throat> uh, I would just touch very briefly on the surgical treatments. Um, this is a whole topic. In, its, in of itself. Um, typically, it is seen to be uh, on par with conservative treatment. Um, one literature review um, showed that 80% were actually returned to play uh, in both cases. However, you have about five month um, span in the conservative treatment versus seven to 12 months for the surgical treatment. Um, <clears throat> and you can understand that uh, in patients that have a similar chance to uh, resolve, it would, be, it would make sense to try all conservative measures first. Um, surgery is typically done in most cases for this condition if it's unstable defect, um, and that would be if it's bilateral or if there's signs of spondylolisthesis. Um, <clears throat> so spondylolisthesis is the uh, translation of the of one vertebral in body in respect to the other. Um, in this case, you have L4 over L5 an uh, anterolisthesis. Um, now these conditions are very highly re interrelated although they're not exclusively interrelated, um, but 50 to 8% uh, as cited by one study showed that um, they're concurrently diagnosed um, in bilateral defects more likely to progress uh, as you have instability um, on both uh, neural arches and that allows the spine to have more um, hypermobility. The causes of this condition are typically um, isthmic, which is what we we're talking about today mostly, and also degenerative is, is the next most common, and that could be from um, you know, essentially uh, facet arthropathy. Um, you also have all the other trouble. Um, the other more common one is congenital, um, which we may talk a little bit about later. Um, as far as the classification, um, pretty simple classification based purely on the slippage. Um, normal spine seen upper left, uh, less than 25%. 
um, is not usually too big of a concern. Um, patients can typically be treated conservatively there. Uh, I found in the literature that grade two slippage is, um, I think this is kind of where your, your judgment comes in. Um, in grade two, I've seen some studies cite that, uh, you know, they recommend avoiding sports with high contact, whereas others, you know, if you're having a stable defect, maybe you are able to do that. Um, slippage grade three and four, very severe. You can see how you get very easily at this stage have um, central canal stenosis, radicular symptoms, and um, a lot of mechanical symptoms, actually. Um, to, to assess stability, though, you would look at the uh, flexion and extension x-ray. Um, a large movement between flexion and extension of the vertebral body would indicate an unstable defect and maybe make you more likely to have a patient um, refrain from these activities. So the presentation, um, similar to spondylolysis, however, you, do, you have some differences. Um, you can't have reports of the back giving away or locking, and you can see how that makes sense given the last slide shows the rate of um, slippage. It is hard to difficult, it is difficult to pinpoint the pain as before. Um, it's often associated with other conditions, uh, as it makes sense. You know, you're, you, you essentially change the uh, biomechanics of the spine with this condition, so um, all bets are off as far as um, other pathology. Um, on the upper right here, you see what they would call as a midline sill sign. So you see a, what is a little dimpling of the actual skin, um, followed by, and also a crease of the skin, which would show that there's possibly a step off there of the vertebrae. Then you can palpate it, um, and then you can even have the patient um, flex and extend, similar to what you do in an x-ray, and you may be able to, in the office, if it's severe enough, even see if there's a uh, anterior thesis. Um, as you can see here, this is a diagram on the right, also showing um, what you will feel on exam. So the spinous processes are what you would feel from a midline palpation. They will be um, excessively uh, open during uh, flexion in this condition, and they'll be relatively more closed. And so you'll feel a, a larger change than you would normally feel in another vertebrae. So just a brief epidemiology of this. Um, I've, I found it interesting that uh, it was reported as as high as 29% in uh, women over 65. Um, and I imagine they all don't have spondylolysis, so there's other things um, going on, likely degeneration and uh, joint laxity um, leading to translation of the um, vertebral body. Um, progression, likewise, is associated with facet hypermobility. Um, a study looking at risk factors of, of many causes in these patients um, found only two things that really led to the uh, progression of the disease. And one was uh, associated with females, and two was hyperlaxity. And I imagine they're both um, for a similar reason, some overlapping conditions there. Um, as hyper as hypomobility um, of the facet joint would stabilize the lesion and um, essentially lock it in from from slipping. Um, I think most notably though is that the sports and labor intensive jobs don't seem to be associated with the progression. Um, I think this um, goes back to with this condition you're looking at the stability of the defect um, which usually comes into play with the flexibility of this of that portion of the spine. So even patients who are in sports, with a lower grade spondylolisthesis, um, if it appears to be stable, they're unlikely to progress as someone that has an unstable def defect who is not in, in, in a sport or a labor intensive job. Um, so that may be something that you know, helps your clinical judgment when telling these patients recommendations. And um, even patients with stable lesions over years will tend to have pain. Um, I want to go over a few studies that sort of relate some of these conditions together. Um, so in this study, we have a uh, single center perspective study. Um, there's 10 patients with uh, degenerative disc disease, 10 with spinal lobosthesis. Um, they use MRI and fluoroscopy to, um, just to um, assess the distance between spinous processes, as we saw in the exam maneuvers before. Um, this looked at the change in um, supine stand and flexion extension um, distances. And uh, these patients of note were all all the spondylolisthesis patients were um, non-surgical stable patients. And so as a result, you look and see here that in de degenerative disc disease, um, there's an increase even further than spondylolisthesis of these uh, spinous distances. And that's likely due to um, a shortening of the, the spine at that segment, um, leading to a larger change in um, spinous processes. Whereas the spondylolisthesis has a smaller change compared to that um, likely due to the fact that um, these patients that are stable have um, 
hypermobility. And that actually may be something that um, prevents um, the, the translation. Um, similar condition that's uh, related to these distances um, is a Bastrop's disease. It is a uh, narrowing of the inner spinous distance. So you can see in the upper right, there's what they would call a kissing spine, um, where the actual um, spinous processes will touch, rub, um, and this is especially evident during um, excessive lordosis, um, which is one of the main risk factors. The other conditions we mentioned, uh, spondylolysis and spondylolisthesis, also lead uh, to the same conditions, uh, increasing strain of posterior spinal elements, increase in lordosis, um, and change in biomechanics, all thought to uh, contribute. Uh, also, distal degeneration, as the height of the height between vertebral bodies is now shortened, um, you see a lot of the same complications. So in the bottom right, you can um, actually diagnose this with just um, an x-ray. Uh, we see the spinous processes are touching, if not very near, even on um, normal posture. In the presentation, pretty um, uh, pretty generic. You have midline back pain, reproducible, um, usually not radicular. But as with all these conditions, you can see radicular uh, problems with um, severity. So in the upper <clears throat> right image, we have um, you can see from, from the slide, there's a, would be a, essentially a bursitis or a pseudobursitis um, secondary to um, uh, ir, uh, inflammation. And on the bottom, you actually see bursitis between um, joints. Um, so this is why in this, in this condition, um, typically seen in um, the elderly, um, you, you'll get also either a CT or MRI um, because you're not looking to see a diagnosis here. You're looking to see are there any other conditions that need to be treated that are associated with it, such as um, edema, cyst formation, sclerosis, hypertrophy, um, you can have masses uh, as well. Um, I think most importantly, you have you can have central canal stenosis. Um, and as you as noted, the other the uh, other conditions we talked about um, don't classically have this, but as you can see, all these in increasing severity can have radicular symptoms um, and may require surgery. <clears throat> Um, I did find a study that treated some of the uh, more mild conditions, such as the bursitis with a steroid inject injection. Uh, I don't think it's been all that well studied as far as other treatment. It seems to be very, um, sim it seems to be very symptomatically um, driven um, with surgery being for more severe defects. <clears throat> so um, earlier I touched on uh, the facet joint orientation. Um, we'll talk a little more about that here. Um, this is... Uh, Mostly a review slide here. Um, we already mentioned that you know extension and compression are all um, stabilized by the facet joint. You can see it is a significant weight-bearing element of the spine. 25 to 33 percent were seen, um, or per percent of the spinal weight is seen um, to go through the uh, facet joints. It's higher with distal degeneration, as the, as I mentioned, the uh, height um, is decreased, and also I imagine with any sort of hyperlordosis, you're going to see that as well. Um, I don't know what the upper limit is, but I imagine it can be very high considering some of the pathologies you'll see. Um, and I, I consider this a natural progression from uh, the aforementioned conditions we, we talked about earlier. Um, the actual joint itself of note is a synovial joint. Um, so it has all the same characteristics of any synovial joint. Uh, it has joint fluid. I think the fluid is estimated like one on one cc. Um, it has the same sort of uh, nutrient and blood supply as any other joint requiring um, some motion and compression to uh, distribute those nutrients. Um, I think the most important thing to look at here is that um, in the lumbar spine you have um, fairly restricted rotational movement, which plays into the fact that baseball players, golfers, soccer players can also have some of these same conditions. Um, the orientation of the facets is, is what, what mostly causes that, um, and I think it's estimated that each lumbar vertebrae only has about one degree of rotation, um, which is in uh, pretty stark difference to the uh, thoracic spine. So to compare those two, um, you'll see on the left side of the page that um, the orientation of the thoracic spine facet joints, they are narrower and also they're more um, anterior posterior facing versus the lumbar, which is more medial facing. Um, and that makes sense because the thoracic spine has a much higher degree of uh, rotational uh, freedom, whereas the lumbar spine is essentially specialized in flexion and extension, and you can see how that would allow for um, 
a better range of motion with that orientation. Um, it makes sense given that the posterior column is continually stressed with all these conditions and with all these um, risk factors that you'll have facet joints eventually wear out. So um, I know we had to talk about this recently, so I didn't want to belabor the points too much here. I did want to show you some images of the more severe conditions. Um, also, again, some more um, stenosis on the lower image. Um, this will have a little different presentation, um, but I imagine with these people, they have a lot of overlapping conditions, overlapping presentation. Um, you may not always get the uh, best um, best um, presentation that maybe you know would, would be a dead giveaway. Um, so usually you'll see you know acute flares, uh, often stiffness, guarding, sometimes radiculopathy. Um, so we're seeing a common theme here. Uh, I did want to touch on just a couple more studies that I found interesting that sort of interrelates everything. Um, in this patient, um, this is a 14-year-old male. They had a uh, in general absence of uh, a lumbar facet joint, um, which is pretty pretty rare. Uh, less than 30 cases I've seen um, reported. Um, this patient actually presented with volleyball again with a more rotational rotation of the pain. The um, bottom right is reconstruction of of um, the absence of the facet joint. Um, but what was interesting to see is that on imaging the um, the, the uh, other facet joint of the same level um, was extremely hypertrophied, resembling end stage facet arthropathy. Where you'd see someone you know who's very elderly. Um, so you can see how changing the forces on these levels um, contributes greatly to um, these conditions. So you can imagine that you know sports that are one-sided, rotational, um, would would cause these same trouble um, in the facet joints, and also possibly lead to uh, spondylolysis. Um, like I said, we, I, I don't want to get too much into just treatment of facet joints. We did that recently. Um, however, there was a study that looked at um, the same treatment um, for spondylolisthesis. Um, these are all patients um, that were MRI-proven spondylolisthesis. None of them were surgical patients, um, so essentially stable lesions with pain. Um, they probably have other degenerative arthritis, but they weren't necessarily facet joint um, arthritis patients. Patients, um, but in these patients, we there's 40 of them, and they used um, the same uh, radio frequency neuronomy for pain relief, um, treating just the facet joint. And so you can see, 65% of these patients had a significant pain reduction um, after the ablation. So um, you know it can be inferred that possibly some of these pain generators aren't actually the major defects you're looking at, but rather the consequences of them, um, as altering the biomechanics with um, put greater stresses on some of these elements of the spine. Um, in my paper, I think I go through some more about the facet joint. I didn't want to touch on it too much and just for a re re um, reason of length. Um, so in conclusion, um, athletes with repetitive load bearing and extension are at risk for lower back pain. Uh, this lower back pain may be indifferent, may be different than um, more chronic back pains we see in patients as our patients are typically um, more elderly, sedentary, not in the greatest shape, not really as motivated. Um, in these patients, the uh, pars and other posterior elements of the spine, as they're immature during adolescence, are at increased risk. And that's why you'll see a higher rate of uh, pars defects, spondylolysis, and lower back pain in, in um, adolescents from the same causes. Um, these posterior spinal instabilities can lead to spondylolisthesis. Um, the facet joints are the major stabilizers for the progression of spondylolysis. This and spondylolisthesis um, is essentially stabilize the lesion, allowing it to heal versus allowing it to um, translate and progress to more degenerative conditions. Um, and uh, posterior, lumbar, posterior lower back pain, um, as you can see, is a very uh, you know sort of murky condition here. Um, a lot of things are interrelated. Uh, I think the good thing is though is that you have um, similar pathogenesis, so you can have similar treatments. Um, all these patients could benefit from the same kind of physical therapy, same kind of strengthening, flexibility training, as mentioned in the anterior pelvic um, tilt slide. Um, this may help pain. And I think um, what probably needs to be studied a little more is the uh, interventional side of treating these patients. Um, we touched upon that a little bit, but um, I think you're going to see similar treatments for these patients um, as for other more common conditions that have been better studied. Um, so with that, I'll leave it up to any questions. I do want to thank Dr. Weinick for being my advisor and uh, Dr. Phil over here for uh, bringing breakfast.
and I, I, I want to show one last picture of what I consider the uh, immature spine. The references, you can see in my paper a little better. Any, any questions? <laughs> the uh, suit still fits. <laughs> Too much. Uh, besides like neurologic symptoms, are there um, reasons that you wouldn't want to have flat sex on these patients? I didn't run across any. Um, I mean, I, I guess if you're if you're concerned, you could, if you're concerned, I mean, you could probably just um, you probably wouldn't necessarily need the flexion extension views um, if it's that if it's that kind of degree of. Um, of disease, you know, you probably start off with just the uh, AP lateral oblique, go from there. Um, if it's, you know, real severe and they're very limited, you probably go straight to CT MRI at that point. Um, you know, it, it probably doesn't tell you much more than you'd already know um, based on their severity of, of pain. Can you talk about how with the spinal cases, the grade one, you can send them back to play sports. Um, so with the, the athlete like that, it seems like the feedback would be. Um, Sure. So, I mean, um, I think I think pain should probably be your main guide. Um, I th we, we probably have a lot of patients that have some degree of anterior uh, walking around every day, and they're essentially stable um, for whatever reason, whether that's um, the soft tissue elements. The uh, facet joints, you know, just their overall mobility. For some reason, some people tend to stabilize, and they um, don't uh, progress beyond that. Um, maybe that's you know sort of their new equilibrium. Um, you know, in a lot of these patients, you know, you're not really going to see without a surgical treatment, which has its own risk. You're not really going to see that true resolution of the uh, of the yeah, spondylolisthesis on X-ray. So, um, you know, as you can imagine, these patients are pretty motivated. They're not going to you know take no for an answer if they want to play. So. Um, I tend to think, you know, if their pain's better, if it doesn't look like it's um, progressing, if they're doing the rehab and they did sort of the, the whole gamut as we talked about, they're probably safe to at least try to play again. Um, you know, I mean, I'm sure I probably have a little degree of this myself, um, and I really haven't had much pain since um, I was diagnosed. I kind of would like to see um, if I progressed at all, though. So I don't know. We'll, we'll see. Uh, very nicely done. I think the print's a little bit bigger next time. Oh, is it small? Uh, <laughs> the um, controversies I recall, uh, controversies that I recall, um, this happened to my son when he was 16, trying to play, rolling on the ground after hitting a couple balls, and I uh, was you know, my own son was back, and hitting a couple of balls, and it happened again, and damn it, you know, it's, it's got to be bad, and sure enough. The controversy is, is it congenital, is it, you know, a lesion that has been there and all of a sudden has now you know, become active, mm -hmm. or um, or is it something that happens to you? So you know, in the days that I recall, we were doing spec phone, spec phone scan. You didn't mention that. Uh, does that give you any uh, greater degree of accuracy in the chronology of the condition? So I think there was one one small slide that mentioned just you know the uh, bone scan element of that. Um, it, it is used to see sort of acute versus chronic, and if we're seeing signs of resolution. Um, I think talking to the first point, um, so there is a, a portion of people that have this defect that don't have the pain. So they probably don't have to necessarily have an acute event or be sports related. There probably is some predisposition and some early um, defect in life that most people may, may heal, may stabilize, may never cause them trouble. Um, I know that, um, I think I saw, I think I may have mentioned either in the paper or in the slide that 80% um, of the uh, um, 80 of NFL linemen, when they were surveyed for the condition, um, had pain with it as well. So it may be that just that in these sports, we're bringing out the pain factor of it um, rather than you know bringing out the you know every diagnosis of it. Um, and so you know, there's probably a lot of people that have the defect; it's stable, resolved, and one just never know they have it. Um, so that that might be sort of that's sort of my thoughts. And I would also say that. Um, you know, it hasn't really been seen in infants, so I would say you're probably more predisposed to it than be purely congenital, because that there is a congenital form, but um, you know, that's usually excluded from all these talks. So, um, same with Dr. Kamen. Um, 
this is been batted around for forever. It was felt that uh, the perhaps five percent of the population is born with a far uh, more civilized defect. Only fifteen percent or so acquired over the course of their young adulthood, sports and such. We get to be maybe twenty percent of the population, the general population has had it. Is there a congenital? Yes, is there sort of running families? It does. Um, Eskimos may have as high as fifty percent when you go into the thesis be bilateral. Um, NFL lineman, the percentage of similar around 40 percent they reported in the past. I'm not sure if it's quite too sorry. Oh. <laughs> 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 didn't quite get there. And so, so how do they play? Yeah, that's the question. You know, how do they play in, uh, with that? So many people can play with it as long as it's not unstable. Um, when we talk about a young athlete, um, you can have it for many different reasons. You can have it from repetitive stress, and you can have it from acute single high load stress. I was feared in football or high school. Yeah, I was, um, I was here from the back and the front and hyperextended as well. And the bilateral part of the defects in the <coughs> of the thesis. The thing about, about diagnosing um, young children is that um, low back pain in a, in a teen athlete is spinal lysis until you require stretch factor until you do it other way. Hyperextension by pain um, and it's usually really unusual. The younger population think about this guy is in children. But what we want to do is diagnose this in the stress phase and not in the lysis phase, meaning that you have a stress reaction to the part, you don't have a complete fracture. It's only then that the Boston brace is really been shown to protect against future injury. Really, you're just sort of um, having the, the, the patient be restricted by the brace mm -hmm. um, and they cannot participate in sports because of it. If you do have a lysis, it's tough to get that to heal. Again, early diagnosis is important. X rays in a gun. Individual, but the pars, the pars stress, the pars stress, the stress fracture. So periosteitis, beginnings of a, of a fracture. Let me show up on X-ray. So we say you don't really need it to diagnose. You do need other things other than X-ray to diagnose. Um, the clinical suspicion should be that you want to make that diagnosis and say you're having really bad pain. This could be a pars fracture. You need something else other. Than Diagnosing with an MRI. Um, so MRIs are notorious for missing it. So you really have to draw the attention of that to your uh, radiologist. Um, you can do a spec scan, which is the most sensitive, but it doesn't tell you the pathology. So you have a stress fracture, you start a stress reaction. So you combine that with a little bit of CT. And that's a lot of radiation for kids. So you have to balance these things. So I think you can get away from MRI and get it. Asking for thin slices, um, sagittals, as well as thin slices, chromos, and you probably should be able to find it. Axes, you can see <coughs> as well. So uh, you shouldn't see you shouldn't see that big stuff uh, there. So uh, diagnosing early makes a difference. Boston, I, I was a precursor to the Boston brace. That was a bit nice. We had something called the Bennett butterfly brace. Metal bars and leather um, <laughs> straps. Yeah, they didn't have their own Yeah, we all got them. Yeah, and I tell you, as you, as you, as you know yourself, it's hard to keep an adolescent in that. Mm -hmm. Number one, it's not really socially off, you know, acceptable. Uh, and it's hard to sleep in the bricks. And so I give you wear 23 hours a day. You can get only off for showering. You get the brace while the workup's going on with the MRI, and you do a suspected and you suspect it. Well, you mobilize them, yeah. I think you go for a little bit of You want something on them. Well, then, then, so if I mean, you want to uh, you want to do that, well, uh, a lot of money. You know, I think you get away with something that's, that's 
rest and find uncomfortable. That rest is the So the same part of that is in Germany, you know, computer on a model, you set it in the and then you say that it's okay. It's a useful good model. And so, um, so uh, we go to the courses together. <laughs> So, um, so your suspicion should be high and in there. We talk about, about secondary sort of treatments, more, more interventions like treatments, with um, catching this early on. You know, the the, the non-union rate of spondylolysis is quite high. You make a fibrous connection, that may suffice. It really, are looking to get an osseous future. The thing these days is, um, <coughs> in the last five years, there's in certain institutions that you use in the pedicle screw, which you're supposed to be a common look because you're the pedicle, it's supposed to be the human body. And then they use something called a laminar hook. Laminar hooks are generally used in the past to, um, to help in uh, scoliosis surgery, to get a grip on the lamina in order to uh, attach the bar above it. So they use laminar hooks um, and a pedicle screw together and they sink it down and they pull that fusion, that crack together with this, this from the patient. They rough up the surfaces and hopefully, you know, it causes a little pack of the bone in there and it will heal. They had an extraordinarily high fusion rate and they used DMP, um, which uh, would um, cause a great inflammatory reaction. Unfortunately, sometimes it was so, so much so uh, the body would react that bone morphogenic protein uh, that uh, you could uh, get some swelling and cause some of the nerve damage and other things. And so they stopped. But that is still probably the future of that. Just to be a little out of the and leave it as it is. Can you play? Well, you can play, you can go back to play. Many people play with this. Um, they have a license and they don't want to do this. I did it going to play lacrosse, I couldn't go back to play football. Uh, and we've gone back to weightlifting and doing other things. And so we're pretty, we're pretty good at that. One of the things is, though, you know, if you've got a bad back and you have a segment that may not be that stable, it really behooves you to sort of think about the future. We don't do that often. I think strength training is good if you have that in this room. You shouldn't do that. You should do the core strength. Uh, you should do within avoiding hyperextension. Um, you should keep yourself extremely flexible to the hip if you can. Because anything that causes you to know that the anterior is going to tell us, it's going to cause the hyper to your back. Right? So this, uh, this, you think about the sacrum and the spine moving in the opposite direction of the hinge. And so um, you, know, you want to make sure that you keep yourself flexible. As far as how this progresses, so we don't talk about this thesis, we talk about this disease may be beneficial in the sense that it causes the facet. Is that what you're saying? The facet, well, hypermobile facets would essentially help the, the, stop the progression, but at the expense of the actual joint itself. Right, it would. And so it, but this disease causes you to, uh, I mean, this disease that level on your brain, you never really get it. Uh, because you slip more. So you think about a tire on um, um, the The tire, if, if it's blown up, taut, the walls of the tire are, are hard and they limit play. Same thing with the anterior posterior longitudinal ligament and the fibrosis of the basement drop down a little bit. And those, those ligaments are looser. So there's more play at that same. Mm -hmm. So when you read the MRI, you put up that 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 thing of the phosphorus disease, <clears throat> MRI phosphorus disease. People don't look at that. It's so often overlooked. You see that there was a sort of a, a high signal between the spinous process and the bright signal. Mm -hmm. That tells you there's a shear going on. So you read that as okay, maybe this has some signal instability, or maybe this is just just uh, you know, <clears throat> repeated compression. So you read those things and think about how we're going to read the patient. As well, when you think those exam shows, 
and what several findings you see in this. Maybe there is a little segment that's devoted to that. Flexion and extension views are are used to see if there's any translation of motion in the state of segment. The motion from lateral to lateral, and flexion and extension are much fine. The problem is they're not that accurate. If you uh, if you actually stand up and they're really strong back, they can sort of resist some of that anterior translation of the muscles. There's an article back in 91, I remember because that the doctor was sharing with me that he was in the bottom. I didn't see that. There's a lot of trauma. Yeah. Um, the, uh, they show that perhaps we would do better by lying on the patient down the table. We demonstrate its ability. Is it possible to get out of the temple? You can't order anything. Not on the menu. Not on the menu. You can actually put a comment that says, please perform on the you know, lateral line. So, um, what's the cutoff you use for this debate? Oh, the five? Five is four, five, five. And as you, you, know, as you get older, you have more, you have to set up rocket view. With the best set of rock, you get more spurring, and if it's edge land, you get more, you get this disease, you get more, you get more anti spurring, so you narrow this range. And so it's then that you see more of the of this diagnosis. You know, you get about it, you get this. People live very well with the, uh, uh, the lady here. The other thing I look for, um, and you see it frequently, is uh, lumbarization. And I know that patients are more mobile, and as a consequence, they get more perceptive. And they often need a mechanical source of their pain, and that's in that 30 to 50 year old range. And you see it in an overdose, it's hard to progress at this point. It's going to be a lot of stimulus. Mobilization, uh, I think, is a, is a real uh, plan to me. I think that this is a uh, potential for a condition condition and a conceptual condition. Need to apply to Right. So when you look at a spine, not all the facets, posterior element abnormalities are, are rather common. You may have, say, atrophies, and you may have one facet angled this way and another one angled like this. And so it's never really symmetric. But the think of all the motion being very symmetric or not. Um, you have one joint that's stiffer than another. Um, you may have a <coughs> with, with uh, a vertilati syndrome or um, a transitional lumbar vertebrae. You may have other abnormal motion, stabilization of lumbar vertebrae. So you mentioned um, rhizotomy. As a, as a way to address the back. How does that feel? Anyone can speak up. So, uh, how does that feel? What does that mean with the, the central back? So, I mean, I, uh, I talk about much in the presentation, but in the uh, paper, I go through it a little bit better towards the end. Um, so, you know, essentially, you have the medial branches and you'll um, Ablate the, both above and below the lesion, in hopes that you, you know, decrease the or, you know, inhibit the uh, pain generator um, using the uh, you know a certain frequency of the um, the catheter tip. Okay. So is it successful? Can we have another? I mean, I saw a lot of studies. Um, some would use. 100% resolution, someone used 80%, someone used 50%. Um, I mean, it, it was variable, I, you know. Um, well, at, I don't think so. Just reporting. Yeah. So, yeah, so, so what happens if it doesn't work the first time? What do you do? Can you go back? Can you try it again? 
you could you could try. And that might be wiser. What's the side of that? Where is that? Um, that the <coughs> medium range of the, of the posterior primary range. You got it. You get muscle atrophy. You go back a second time, you get more that muscle atrophy. You're getting more complete. Um, whereas out of the nerve. Unfortunately, that's like that branch comes off. But there's another branch that comes back and it continues. You catch that branch. So you cause injury to the parasitic muscle. We have a case, we saw a case this year, so I wish I had to, to try to find it. Of a <clears throat> patient who had bilateral L1 to L, L, sorry, L1, L2 to L5, S1, to set by a less than block of the um, And so when we looked at the MRI, there was no paraspinal muscles. They had repeated, repeated series. They would make money. It's made the back pain was required. We were dying in everything. Now, I'm not saying that that happens in everything. So you have to think about what you're doing in it. I think it's not defensive later on. So if you destabilize the spine by just stabilizing muscle for the spine. What's up, guy? Yeah, and they're the ones that are generally affected. Right? So you fight about everyone's going to think how stable is your spine going to be. So you have to think about this as a place to have a tool that you don't always use all the time. And it's short, it's short sight. There's a great little book on patients who have intensity for this. Talks about 595 on Amazon called the Multifidus Back Pain Book by Jim Johnson, a physical therapist. And it's all about multifidus exercise. It's very simple, very straightforward. Illustrations aren't great, but for you know, 10 bucks, whatever it is, it's a good deal. And that's a great way to approach it, especially when you start sticking pedicles really in there. <laughs> yeah, I would, I'm not saying you don't do art, day, but I think you, you be mindful of it, you know, and uh, what you're doing. I mean, people, people don't think about going on and going on. And, yeah, one level, okay. Maybe they are up by, but you start thinking, I'm going to do my dogmate on this entire side. You're really setting up the patient that's probably down the road. You have to know that. Um, I don't know of any suits that have come out of that lawsuit, but sooner or later someone will. Um, I don't think you should practice defensive medicine. You should practice defensive medicine. You keep you out of the problem. So, this is a great topic. Thanks, everybody. This is a nice people.